You know how y'all hate sometimes we talk about sports and other non-related market things? Well, you might as tune us off right now because there's not much going on. A Wells Fargo downgrade, Tilray earnings, CPI tomorrow. That's a piece, though. We're getting a rally going. We survived Thursday. It's now Tuesday. And you know what? It's T3 Tuesday. Red Dog coming on at 8.35. Let's start the session. Welcome to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep. This is a volatile puppy here. It's all about execution style and strategy. All right, good morning, traders and investors. We got a little rally going on here up nine and a quarter handles at uh, 55.62 even. Uh, we have the buck under 104, down nine cents, 103.81. Not seeing much on the chart there in the dollar futures. TLT, I still got up there. I got to get my bonds up there. Trying to get back above 92, up 47 cents at 91.85. Crude in the 86 handle. It's flat at 86.43. Gold going to the moon up 21.60 at 23.72.70. Silver up 37 cents into 28 handle. You talk about a catch up trade. There it is. Uh, Bitcoin futures, we're down about a G on the futures at 71,155. Let's welcome back Dennis here. And Dennis, should we start with your vacation? Or should we start with sports? Sports. Sports? sports. Okay, let's bring, let's bring in AB in Cause here. Because honestly, like both of us had money riding here. And tell your story, Joel, because mine didn't end as well as yours did. Mine was exciting for a while. Joel, Joel did a lot better job here. I did. I did. And uh, I am officially re- uh, announcing my retirement from sports wagering. and For, for the and- 27th time. <laughs> for the 27th time, the 27th 288 time. people in a pool. You're looking at the winner. Winner, wow. winner, chicken dinner. 288 of That's the impressive, bet. actually. 288. Yes. I only had that's- 10 people in my pool. I almost won it, but I didn't. Yes, 288, and, uh, that's impressive. That's I'll actually tell you, the only impressive. reason I won, and it was dumb luck, is because I took Bama in the final four. And the reason I took Bama to make it to the final four is their coach used to be a coach, a high school coach in Romulus, Michigan, which is not far from here. And my nephew's friend is the graduate manager. So how is that for some sophisticated analysis? But I will tell you, and this is going to be a little bit of a hedging lesson here. I did. I did lose a little bit of money on my hedge. You went out and hedged. I hedged it because it was a free market prep. That's how I do stuff too. Lock it in. Lock yeah. it in. Tell us how you hedged it. How did you hedge I took, your bet? I took I took uh Purdue in the points. They were getting seven points. So if Purdue if UConn would have won and not covered, it would have been a home run. Well, speaking of UConn covering the spread, UConn has now played twelve. NCAA, uh, you know, March Madness games in the last two years, and they're 12 and 0 against the spread. So, someone do the math out there. Where, oh. if, you, where if you took a hundred dollars yeah. in round one last year of UConn against the spread and you just rolled it over every single time and took them against the spread, I mean, it is one of the most dominant two year runs in college basketball of all time, if not the most dominant. Why didn't last you tell year, me that when I was talking to you about hedging, AB? Why didn't you tell me that then? Well, they were a wagon, but I mean, like, look, with Purdue last night, so UConn ended up winning by 15 points, so they covered the spread by double, They, you know, and so, yeah. um, but, you know, with Purdue, if if that ED guy plays well and has a good game, they can hang with anyone, so I was like, okay, yeah. well, if, if any, you know, if anyone could hang with UConn and maybe hanging with UConn just means covering the spread because ain't no one beating them right now, that's clear, uh, you know, I thought that Purdue may have a chance of covering the spread, they, of course, uh- did not, but... Uh, it was going to be tough. I had Purdue. The reason, because you knew everybody's going UConn, and you just try. You got to do something different. When you're doing these pools, you got to call some upsets. If you're going to go with the favorite that Joel did, you got to call some other upsets early. Like you said, Bama won you that pool because how many other people had UConn? Probably had half the pool. Oh, right. a lot of probably people. at least a yeah. hundred. But yeah. I so last year when UConn was a four seed, I had them to win my bracket, and I was the only one in my pool. So by the time they even got to the national championship, I had like clinched it. And like you said, Dennis, I'm always trying to do something because it's so hard to. I mean, Joel did it. 
which is impressive. It's hard to win one of those oh, pools when you have the like favorite or a one seed. So I was trying to do something different. My team this year got bounced first round, but last year I had UConn and I was trying to be different and it worked out. I Kentucky? couldn't take them again this year. I should have just kept riding with the train and, and taking them again. Joel, going back to your, uh, you know, Bama coach, I'm pretty sure Nate Oates was like, he was like a, a high school teacher at the school like 10 years ago. And now he was in in the final four. I mean, he's had an incredible story. Then he went to Buffalo. Then he went to Buffalo. And uh, no, but. Um, okay, you know, they're going oh, nuts in the chat. They're done with the sports talk. Okay. We're only allowed to. Uh, Minutes of sports, but four minutes. Okay. And, and they probably don't want to talk about my trip here either, but I did boots on the ground. So I was in Tampa, St. Pete's, my brother-in-law's father-in-law's got a place down there. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a, it was a great trip. If my father-in-law is listening, um, but boots on the ground, I was doing homework when I was down there checking and analyzing. So one, the one I went to McDonald's, I actually tried to go to McDonald's. And I'm like, it was late night. I'm like, oh, there's Mickey D's. I'll go get to the, hit the dollar menu. Hit the dollar menu at Mickey D's. I've not been to McDonald's in the States in years. So I'm assuming, you know, McDoubles are probably like a buck 29. Hell no. On the dollar menu, there's nothing for a dollar. I'm looking at the dollar menu. It says dollar menu. You know how much the McDouble was on the dollar menu? 250. Yeah. 329. 329. For a McDouble. I'm like, you know how much it is in Canada? $2.99. But our exchange rate's less. It's got to be less. How is it more? It's more money than it is in Canada. I'm like, you know what? I'm going in Monday morning, well, Tuesday morning, when I'm coming back and shorten the hell out of McDonald's because inflation at McDonald's is rampant. And then I look at the bloody stock chart and I think, well, why didn't I go on this trip a month ago? Because the stock is down almost 10% the last month. So, man, they front run my trip. I had no idea. The prices at McDonald's are completely out of hand. I knew in Canada they had went up. They went up way more in the States. I don't know why that is. But I tell you right now, McDonald's got to figure that out because you can't be going and spending 50 bucks for people for a four family meal at McDonald's. It's way too much money. Okay, that's my rant on McDonald's. Inflation. What about Tesla? What about Tesla? So, driving back from Toronto, nice. Tesla lot there just north, you know, actually getting towards Barry. And my brother in law points it out. He's like, Look at the Tesla lot. He's like, I've never seen, you know, there's never any cars on that lot. He's like, It's packed. I'm like, Oh my gosh, it is full. Tesla lot completely full of cars, like so many cars. And he's right. There was never any cars on that lot. They couldn't keep them in. So, you know what? Supply is no longer an issue for Tesla. Demand is a major issue. So two major trading ideas here. Again, problem is Tesla's already been hammered and McDonald's already hammered, so they've front run it. But I'll tell you, when you put the boots on the ground, you know why McDonald's is starting to fall off. You know why Tesla can't catch a bit. We already know the Tesla the demand was down because we know the quarter. But I'm just saying, when what I'm seeing out there, it matches the stock performance, folks. Tesla, McDonald's, not doing that well. Aaron, you had boots on the ground, too. With, uh, remind me, Costco, Costco. Oh, God, we talked about this yesterday. I already went on my Costco. Oh, you already went yesterday. through it. Okay. It's you just were just two, telling me. Two, Costco's two always packed. Yeah. You never go to a Costco. It's not packed. Never find a parking spot. No, when we did, when we did talk about McDonald's yesterday, briefly, I mentioned, you know, the app does help a lot. You can get, you know, they have like a, a coupon you could use every single day on the app to take 20% off. I believe too, at least the McDonald's I go to here on the the quote unquote dollar menu because it's not a dollar menu but they have it's always like a buy one get one for a dollar so i'll get one mcdouble one mcchicken one of the sandwiches comes out to a dollar so at the end oh, of the so day give you a little, if you got the coupons you're okay yeah well not even you don't even need to use the app to get that one but uh the app does help a lot and then um the other thing that i mentioned yesterday is they well, do what's like the regular so the regular price of the mcdouble is cheaper on your menu you think I, well, I was just going to say they do it. They do a dynamic pricing thing where in certain areas, like if you're in New York City, the, Mc, the McDonald's prices are different than if you're in, like 10 bucks downtown New York. Yeah. Des Moines, <laughs> Iowa. So it's it, it's it's slightly different. Bar, yeah. uh, varies where you are. So I don't know where in Florida, potentially maybe it was on one of their higher end things. But uh, either way, I mean, like I wouldn't be buying McDonald's stock up here either. But again, if you're out there trying to save money at McDonald's, can't emphasize it enough. Use right. the app. Try to try to you know maximize all your deals, and and you're not getting the you know hot dog and and soda dollar fifty prices that you get at Costco, but you're still getting. Uh, you a guys little should bit not be eating at McDonald's. I know, I know. Okay, First it does taste all. good, Joel. 
The taste is good. <laughs> and pub, yeah, and, and when I, you've had a couple beers, late night McDonald's, you know what that's all about. It's like my college days. Um, PE, 23 on McDonald's. 4P is 21. I'm not paying them better than market multiple for a company that can't control inflation and their prices. So maybe it's price gouging and they can bring these prices back down. Their margins are just awesome. But, you know, when we look at the margins, they ain't that. Well, actually, they're pretty good. You know what? Um, I, I, let's just look at the other fat. Maybe Wendy's. they can drop the pricing back down with the price. Maybe it's charging because they can. But I'm like, I tell you, in Canada, I have actually stopped pretty pretty much going to McDonald's because the prices just went up too much. And then I'm like, well, I'll go to McDonald's down, you know, Florida because oh, it'll be way cheaper. No, more money yet. I'm like price gouging everywhere. Done with McDonald's. You know what? Wendy's has never gone anywhere. That's always been, you know. Wendy's is expensive, but if you get the coupons at Wendy's, it's good. Me and the kids go to Wendy's. We get the mailer coupons come in. You get the, like, two can dine for, it used to be like two can dine for nine ninety nine. Gone are those days. But, like, two can dine for, like, sixteen ninety nine. Like, me and the boy can dine. Get the cute little girl Happy Meal. Or not Happy Meal. It's called it Wendy's. But, you know, kids meal. And we're out of there for, like, 25 bucks. It's not bad. But if you don't have the coupons, you're murdered. You know, you're murdered. So you got to have the coupons. That's the is this is this QSR? Is that Tim Hortons and like somebody else? The QSR Popeyes or Burger King was in there. Did they get rid of the Popeyes out of there? I don't remember. I think Popeyes is still. And I think they bought Popeyes. I think Pop QSR is Popeyes, like main one. QSR restaurants. I believe Popeyes is the biggest one in there. One of the biggest names, anyways. Well, QSR what's Tim Group. Hortons? Tim Hortons. Well, maybe it went back in there. Tim Hortons might be in there now, too. Because Tim Hortons went public, remember? And then it didn't go that way. Yeah, it is. Tim Hortons in there, too. Tim yeah, Hortons, I, Wendy's. I feel like Popeye's in here, too, though. Isn't Popeye's in here, too, folks? I don't know. I don't know. I think we're making it. Didn't they everyone... buy? Didn't QSR? Who bought Popeye's? Somebody bought Popeye's. So they used to trade. It's P-O-P-E. I think, I thought it went to QSR. I'm looking at their website, though. They don't have it on the front page. So maybe it's not. Should have did more research on this before you took me on this uh, segue here. Pa- restaurant brands bought Popeye. Yeah. What about, Sha- what about Shake Shack? Restaurant brands is Popeye's. Oh, don't get Dennis started on Shake Shack. You're talking about extensive- You know what, though, Joel? Let's just talk here. If McDonald's is going to jack their price, maybe Shake Shack, relatively speaking, is actually getting cheap because you get the beer at Shake Shack. I mean, I had a McDonald's and it cost me 20 bucks to get out of there. Might as well go to Shake Shack. Maybe it's maybe that's the reason Shake Shack's doing better. McDonald's inflated the prices so much that Shake Shack is somewhat appealing now. And it's better quality. I mean, the burgers oh, there are pretty quality. good. Way better quality. I always said, though, Shake Shack, Five Guys. I'm like, I still like Five Guys more than Shake Shack. Sorry, Shake Shack. Uh, I do want to go burger, back. But Five Guys cheaper and it's better. I do want to go back to Tesla real quick because, uh, Dennis, to your point, I mean, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, inventory problems at Tesla, demand problems. There's a yeah. reason. Anytime you're 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 cutting prices, if you're a company, it's probably it's typically because yeah, you're 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 having demand issues. Um, but Dennis, wouldn't right now, because you're bullish, the you know future for the humanoids for the company and all this, like, wouldn't you want the stock to continue to get crushed right now and and hope that uh, you know like you'll have a, a chance to buy it around one twenty yeah. or something for yes. the long term, yes. and so. Maybe the maybe the fact that the car bit part of the business is struggling right now will actually set up for a good long term investment because I actually am starting to grow a little bit more. You know, the humanoid thing I do think will be a huge market opportunity. I don't know if for sure Tesla is going to be the leader in that. That's the they, issue there. They will be a player, um, but you also have the energy storage. And the more I read about the future of energy storage. Tesla already has kind of a head start in terms of its infrastructure and all this. And like, I think Tesla's Tesla's energy storage business 20 years down the road, I think could be as big, if not bigger than its EV business. This Tesla 160 level jewel is the rock of Gibraltar. And on Friday, again, tests that 160 level and bounces right off of it. So you have technical support very, 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 very well defined here. Until it breaches 160, keep playing it off those levels. That's the third time it's worked off this level. Now it's up to 173. And again, we did the robo-taxi thing. You guys probably talked about that yesterday because that came out Friday night. I did see that in the news. There's a lot of potential revenue streams, different ones coming for Tesla. Problem is they're all a long ways away. You know, the humanoids are talking 2027 at the earliest. That's three years away. And the core car business is suffering here right now. And we're in a market that is what have you done for me lately market. They want immediate gratification. And the you know, so, so we can say, you know, 10 years from now, I think Tesla stock is a lot higher. 
And I do believe this is the reason why they didn't don't get killed on these reports because people can see the other potential revenue streams coming. Um, but it's still 50 times earnings and the core business is not doing that great right now. So that's the issue. If you're buying it here and stick in your portfolio for the next 10 years, I think you make money. If you're buying it here and sticking in your portfolio for the next 10 days, it needs more robo-taxi headlines. So we actually did not really talk about this yesterday, Dennis. So let's talk about it real quick, recap what happened. So on Friday, Reuters came out with a headline that basically said Tesla is scrapping its plans for the $25,000 cheap EV. The stock got uh, you know, punished down 6% intraday. Elon Musk came out and refuted that claim, said not true. This is fake news. Essentially, a stock rebounded uh, pretty quickly. And then Elon, I saw this, responded on X Twitter to a uh, to a comment that someone said what Tesla is. So this person was speculating and said what Tesla is probably doing is the robo taxi car and the cheap EV are based on the same model car it's going to be the same car tesla seeing more opportunity in the robo taxi versus the the cheap ev so they're kind of doubling down on the robo taxi while putting the not putting the uh the cheap one on the back burner i, I think it's like a model two or something I don't know, someone in the chat helped me out that but basically just that tesla is allocating more resources toward that robo taxi because again it's built on the same model of that cheaper twenty five thousand dollar car and it's going to be a bigger revenue driver because you can sell the one car for twenty five thousand dollars, or you can produce the robo taxi for twenty five thousand dollars and then get recurring revenue, you know, over yeah. time for it. I actually like, I, and I do think Tesla will be the first one with these robo taxis, and that will so uh, be the first one. But I think there's no way that over time you're not seeing other players come into that space. I mean, whether you're talking Toyota, you know, whoever Waymo, all these other companies that are also doing it. So. um I mean, yeah, I get it. Dennis, like, did you get your Fords? I know you were waiting for it to come down to 13. I talked about, we set it at the 13. But um, it never got there. We, 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 well, it never quite got there. But University of Windsor, when we did the lecture, we actually gave this trading idea and we talked about setting it up where Ford had the breakout and then you had the market sell off. I'm like, 13, old resistance becomes new support. I'm like, yep. you believe in that? You're right there at that 13, got 1309. Again, I was going on vacation too, so you know, the next day. So it's not like I'm really entering trades when you're going away for three days. Um, kind of like to. What about for your long term really portfolio, Dennis? Well, I don't know if I like it for long term, though. You know, oh, I, you I liked it for a trade. I'm still not. Again, the PE is reasonable stuff. But what one Ford's not talking robo taxis. They're throwing EVs out. I mean, Ford's taking Ford is doing well right now because they're grab, grabbing the market that is currently working. You know, this consumer we've already talked about is strapped for cash on the high end stuff. That's why you know you're not seeing EVs sell because they're just too much bloody money. Ford obviously can produce a vehicle, you know, fairly, you know, non, not not talking obviously EVs because they're scrapping all of those, but they know what they're doing in combustion engines. So um, that's why I think Ford and GM, and I just think the technicals line up well. Like I like it for a swing trade off the 13. I don't know if I'm a big Ford long term fan. If I'm buying a stock for the next 10 years, I'd honestly still rather buy Tesla than Ford, even though the P is whatever it is, seven times as much. There's so many revenue streams that are eventually going to come for Tesla. You know so, what? But... Just just, just look at this GM chart here. I just want to alert our GM traders here that you had a, a, a peak of 46.04. Uh, that was on Thursday, believe it or not. And you had a little, about a two and a half point break. You're trying to get half of that back right now. So I keep a real close eye. If you think Ford's going to 46, 47, 48, 50, then you got you to gotta take out the... Get a bid here at 44.60, 44.75. Currently trading up on uh, 12 cents here, working their way into the big red bar. High of the move that was made on Thursday in GM 46.04. And you remember when all you guys were just just trashing Ford and GM during the strikes? You remember that? Oh, they're gonna put them out of business. The wages and that wasn't everything. Me. That wasn't yeah, me that trashing. Was I was trashing Ford and GM because I've been trashing them for years. I wasn't trashing them because of the strike. I actually said they'll get the bounce once the strike gets settled. And it's what hell of a bounce? Let's hell of the bounce. bounce. Like GM's come back a long ways, a long ways. But let's let let's hold off. Just you know, like going all in on Ford and GM here at this moment in time, because you know what's okay. going to matter the most, the most, the thing. What's going to matter the most in the next two days, in the next twenty four hours? Yeah, CPI. 
CPI well, is tomorrow. 24 hours and 10 minutes to be specific. 24, yeah. So 24 <laughs> hours and 10 minutes we get CPI data. The inflation data is hot. Foreign GM get murdered. So, I mean, this is a macro. So right now you can maybe have a one-day trade. If the inflation data is good, they're going to go. So this is it. Like we like we talk about the IWM. We talk about the solar stocks. Maybe we could talk those stocks too. You know, we've talked the you know the regional banks. Ford and GM want rates to come down too. People don't want to pay seven, eight, nine percent financing on their cars. So they need rates lower as well. So if the inflation data is hot and the rates are going to stay higher for longer, that will hammer the stock of Ford and GM. And GM and Ford have had a pretty good run here. So we can, you know, run around and prance around and dance and say out GM. P567. And they're cheap stocks. They're cheap for a reason, though, because interest rates are still high. So, you know, if interest rates start lowering, you want to actually, you know, jump in and buy these stocks. The problem is we keep kicking the interest rate cutting can down the road here. You know, we were like, oh, they're going in March. They're going in March. Well, March is long past us. They're going in June. They're going in June. Now, now they're talking going in July. Well, did you now hear there's Bullard people talking yesterday? not going at all. Did you hear Bullard yesterday? What did he say? No, because I was flying. Uh, three Fed rate cuts this year. So Bullard's and Bullard's usually a hawk. So he's still yeah. that probably helps the market to a certain extent. Yeah, the I mean, Fed's all, over the, all over the place. All over, the, all over the place. You know what? Jerome needs to sit these guys down and say, you know, just shut your mouth and yeah. just you know be what? Quiet. Yeah. That's what he let me handle. Murray. Who? Yeah. yeah, Jerome needs to sit him down and say, look who's you know navigated the soft landing. It's been me, buddy. It's been me. <laughs> I got to sue COVID. Well, maybe gonna say it's I got to sue uh, a, a world supply side crisis. Uh, just shut up. Shut up. Down. Let me handle this. I got the markets at all time highs and inflation still high. I did yeah. something right. And I haven't killed the economy. No. The economy's strong. Jobs are good. Inflation's still somewhat coming down, but not really at McDonald's. So I think CPI tomorrow, though, this is a huge number. We always say, oh, it's the biggest CPI. This it really is a huge CPI number because we've got the IWM that's been holding on. The TLT telling a completely different story. The TLT is scared to death right now. Like, and I'm long some TLT. I keep thinking long-term rates are going lower. But you know what? I've been proving wrong. How do you know you're wrong? You start losing money. So TLT has not been a good call. I mean, average didn't rate around here because I bought some 86, and then I average bought more. I never add to a winner because it brings up that average cost base. It's going to end up being a loser. But not 94, I think I bought some more. We're down here at 91. So the TLT is telling us a different story. It's concerned. Bond traders it are concerned about inflation coming yep. back. We see it. Like, well, I don't know what's going on at McDonald's. You know, maybe it's just McDonald's. You know, the Costco hot dog has been $1.50 since birth. So there's no inflation at the Costco hot dog. But I tell you, the hamburger prices here are completely getting inflated more. We know commodity prices are going up. Gasoline prices have gone up. This CPI number has every potential to be hot. If this CPI number is hot, this market is rally is going to get derailed very, very quickly. Because right now, those bullard comments about three cuts this year, a hot, hot number watch. comes in. And those hot three, watch. that three is going to become a two or a one or a none. They got to keep inflation in check. No. Boots on the ground say inflation is creeping back into this. Guess economy. who's coming on the show tomorrow? Blue. You, man, you guys, I can't get nothing. Joel you knows guys. how to schedule him. We get the Red Dog today who's going to talk us off the ledge, maybe, because Red Dog, um, Red, Red Dog is, Red Dog will go bearish too sometimes. I'm curious what Red Dog's thinking right now. He's coming in 10 minutes. And we got Blue. You're my boy, Blue. He's coming on tomorrow. No. Gonna, you can break this down for us. Real quick, just going to give the numbers preview because it is a little confusing. I guess you have some mixed signals here. CPI year over year is supposed to go to 3.5%, 3.5 versus 3.2 in February. So it's expected to go up three tenths of a percent. But then core CPI year over year is supposed to come in at 3.7, down from 3.8% year over year. Uh, the CPI in March is expected to come in at three tenths of a percent, 0.3 versus 0.4 percent in February. So that is expected to come down as well. So, again, the year over year CPI is estimates are for it to be a little bit higher than it was uh, in February. But then the core CPI year over year is expected to be slightly lower. We've been talking about gas prices for a few weeks on the show. 
I'm looking at the numbers right now where it was at a month ago, where it was at a year ago. And I think a lot of the increase we've seen in the last month, you're not going to see that reflected in there. That's not to say there won't be some energy increase uh, increases uh, in the numbers here in the CPI. But just overall, I want to make the point because I saw a lot of people in the chat yesterday saying that I, I basically said inflation. I've been saying that prices are still too high, still more higher than I'm comfortable paying, still higher than most consumers like Dennis goes to McDonald's. I don't like to see prices this high either. I've said that inflation has been more normalized since where we were at two years. I mean, ten. there's a big difference between nine and a half, 10 percent, 40 year highs versus where we're at now. Does that mean two but, things can be true at once that we're still well, the too problem high. is. You know, when you talk about inflation, it's cumulative here. So when we talk about 4%, it's adding another onto the 10 that you got last year. So you're actually 14 higher. The prices don't actually go down. Deflation. And and always my pet peeve. Remember I said on the show, people who talk deflation is an issue are just stupid, dumb people. Deflation is never an issue. You don't have to worry about stock. You don't have to worry about actual, like, prices in your grocery store going down. That doesn't exist. Right. Once companies make a price for once they decide, hey. They don't go down. Right. Once this burger is three dollars and not two dollars anymore, they ain't going back to two dollars. That's like a known, you no. know, thing. And I do think a lot of the inflation that we've seen and that that's sticky is from some, you know, I don't maybe maybe price gouging isn't the right word, but companies have de- definitely taken advantage of this price opportunity. They, they know there's inflation out there, so they they have an excuse to say, hey, let's charge this when they don't. I mean, look, like you mentioned the Costco thing. I mean, Costco could have jacked it up to two fifty for the hot dog and soda and. You know, people would have been pissed about it, but I think people would have understood, oh, yeah, there's inflation. That makes sense. But they decided not to. And I think there's a lot of other companies that Costco's smart, though, because they know you're going in there and they jacked up the price of everything else. And they see the 150 hot dog. You're like, no inflation at Costco. I love the onions. You got to roll the onions on there. You know, they got the onion roller. (laughs) Get your money's worth in onions. We, we got a question from the chat here. They're addressing it to all three of us, but I think it's more it? relevant to you. I know what my answer would be. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Canada interest rate decision tomorrow and how that relates to us? I don't think it re- relates to So the Canadian interest rate decisions are basically based on all the U.S. economy <laughs> and the Fed decisions. Canada likes to piggyback, but Canada's in a little bit different environment there. So we have been in a recession in Canada. So we have actually had two consecutive quarters of negative GDP and all the other fun stuff. You know, official recession. Real estate prices. Talk to my buddy. Talking to my real estate buddy, Jeff. He's always on boots on the ground. How's it going? I always ask him, how's it going? How's it going? And he's like, it's slow. Real estate market is slow. Prices have come in. Nothing's moving. Like these million dollar houses, nothing's moving in that range because the interest rates are just too high. Again, different environment than the U.S. Because remember, we talk about this a lot. Banks in Canada only like giving five-year fixed mortgages. They weren't given 30-year fixed. They only give five. So those are come and due. So as those come due, that consumer that's been you know sitting here at 1.7, 1.8% is now jacked up to 6%. All of a sudden, they have less disposable income. So Canada's in a little bit different situation. Mm-hmm. That being said, this economy's still hot enough. And I'm not an expert on Canadian interest rates, but I don't think they're going down tomorrow. Maybe they are, and if you're, you know, a lot of people maybe isn't in Canada following. I don't follow it as closely because I trade the U.S. markets. I I have some own, I have some Canadian stocks in my long term portfolio, but I trade U.S. stocks, so I don't follow it closely. Rob McLister is the person to follow. You want to know okay. the, what? You bring know what? on I'm Rob. Gonna, you want to talk Canadian interest rates? Nobody knows more than Rob. He's I'll dial there. him up. I'll dial bring him. Bring Rob up. in because Rob, Rob is the expert. Uh, the yep. banks all go to Rob. Everybody, Rob's the expert. We know Rob well. Former bright trader. The bright trading people all in that office back from 19 and, and, and the whole thing have made so many successful businesses. You know, bright trading was right there. The original high frequency traders, bright trading, and they all just spread out everywhere into so many different businesses. So many successful Rob, Rob as well. Uh, Bring Rob. We will, we will get Rob will tell us about interest rates in Canada. All right. We're creeping higher up 11 handles, 52, 64 and a quarter. You know, we haven't talked about solar stocks in a while. And did you see the eclipse? No. You don't know why I didn't see the eclipse? Completely cloud-covered Toronto area. There was, like, no breaks. It was just brutal clouds everywhere. Where's the sun? No, you can't see the sun. Cloudy. You might have been able to find a little pocket. There was no pocket to be had at my house. Really? No. Hmm. No. 
Well, the solar stocks did okay. I mean, yesterday I looked at first solar. It, you know, that made that look at that run that you talk, Dennis. I'm surprised you didn't identify this as a catalyst. I guess do you look at it as a uh, negative catalyst or a positive? How did you do on your solar sun? The first so so I have a solar panel project. I have a lot of little different, you know, side projects and stuff. And I got the solar panels on the roof, my dad's warehouse there, and it produces about a thousand bucks a month of energy there and just like pays it's nice. That's key span. Yesterday I was like I was like upset because I'm like, oh, it's gonna suck. I'm gonna lose some money right during that eclipse because the sun's not gonna be shining on my solar panel. It's bad for solar stocks. Less sun. But you know, apparently everybody gets talking about the sun. That's a little bit of a joke because it's less sun for two hours. But um for solar, to your points, had a pretty good run here. The only thing that matters to solar stocks, though, even more than the car companies anymore, is the rates. CPI tomorrow. Yeah. The solar yeah. stocks need lower rates. They need them now. First solar, best of breed, is holding on fairly strong. But we know ENPH has been an, a, a disaster. SEDG's been a disaster. The TAN has been a disaster because higher rates for longer are killing these companies here. They are not. The, the solar stocks are in a full recession. Besides, maybe first solar, which come around there in a full recession. So they need lower rates. The CPI is hot tomorrow. They get hammered. The CPI is cool. Then we get a light number tomorrow. Solar stocks will rip. You'll see ENPH up six, seven, eight percent. So on that eight thirty number, you got to have the buy button and the sell button, and you're going after solar. Those are the most leveraged plays to the CPI. Hot sell, not hot buy. That's how. It's Did you work. see the picture of me and Emily uh, watching the eclipse? No, can we can zoom in on that? Can we zoom in on that, AB? You got the glasses yeah, yeah. on? Did you tweet that out? Yeah, I did. I nice. Did. So, oh, you had yeah. some sun, though. So you had some open skies. Yeah, oh, it four? did not get dark. It did not get that dark at all. Uh, you had 99.5, didn't you? What did you say, AB? 99.4? So, yeah. So, so we had 99.4% coverage here in Detroit. You could have driven down an hour south of here to Monroe, Michigan, near Toledo for 100% totality. So in 2017 in uh, Columbia, Missouri, where University of Missouri is, it was like one of the best places in the country to watch it. We had people coming from all over, tourists from all over the country to watch it there. And it was 100%. So th when I saw the 2017 one, it got legitimately dark, like nighttime for two minutes. All the birds stopped chirping. Because they oh, thought I was, heard about that. The yeah, animals they, were supposed they, to they, like, they, felt, they, they went. They went to sleep. They thought it was sleeping. Um, <laughs> and, they're just uh, flying around, you know, enjoying the nice sun. And all of a sudden, it went dark. They just fall asleep like narcolepsy. <laughs> but luckily, the sun just peeked back out before they hit the ground, and then they boom zoomed up. They're like Top Gun stuff. Yeah, and and then this year, watching it in Detroit, 99.4%, my biggest takeaway was we were on the rooftop, I had the glasses watching it. When it got to the peak of 99.4%, you could see one tiny little sliver of the sun, yep. that was it. So most of it was uh, most of it was covered, but that one little sliver of the sun was enough for it to still stay pretty light out. So that was like my biggest sun, takeaway was, so wow, powerful. even 0.6% yep. of the sun was enough to make it stay light out was pretty cool to see. But, uh, you know, I mean, it, I, maybe we should buy some solar stocks. I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you 30 tomorrow. I want that data. That's one you could probably chase tomorrow. You got like one, you got like 30 seconds to chase that solar stocks tomorrow. Hot or not? Um. All right. Well, it is. That's it. Redler, Scott, it's in the background. Red Red Dog, eight thirty four a.m. Let's go ahead and bring on our guest of the day again, Scott Redler from T Three Trading. Let's bring him on. All right. Welcome back, Scott Redler from T. How's it going? How are you doing this morning? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Just getting the day going. Just did about 40 charts, and I'm just trying to look over, you know, potential setups and what could happen today, what might happen tomorrow. And, uh, you know, it's definitely an interesting spot. What do you guys think of this spot? Everything's coiling right in front of the CPI it, it, it tomorrow. Is. It is. Did we, you we see the eclipse? Thursday. Did you see the eclipse where you were, Scott? Oh, I did. I did. It wasn't a great one. It was a little cloudy out. I was actually yeah. on with uh, Liz Clayman yesterday, and it was kind of cool. So we were on it, and she was showing clips from the city, how the city got really dark. So I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, my son was with my wife with the lacrosse team, and they were watching it over at the um, at the field, and they all had their glasses. And it, it, it said it was a little overrated, but I saw some really good clips on Twitter, you know, that were probably better than from, you know, what I heard from people. <laughs> 
anyway. What percentage? I mean, what, what was it? Were you guys in the totality or no? I think New Jersey was like pretty, pretty total, like, you know, over 90%. Okay, um, so probably similar here to in, in Detroit. We had a uh, pretty good totality, but not the full. But all right, let's get to stocks. You said you did 40 charts this morning. What's uh, sticking out to you? You know, it's like you were in this little spot here that it's kind of tough because you have like the yeah. semis are in consolidation mode. And in the past week or so, NVIDIA just feels like it's just channeling and, you know, it's lagging um, a bit. Uh, SMCI is lagging a bit. Uh, AMD has been weaker, so it's been like the semis have not been the bread and butter of the past, uh, you know, uh, of of the past week like they were for the past month. So sometimes you just have to kind of, you know, let them rebuild on the side. In, in in the Magnificent Seven, you know, Amazon's been making me some really good money, but it's like there's no power there either. You have to sell strength, buy a dip, sell strength, buy yeah. a dip. Look at the daily chart, it's like. You know, thank God I'm not looking for momentum there because there has been none, but it's been working higher. It's not that exciting. Um, you know, Google, you could say, has been, you know, if you put Google up, it's been best in breed lately, you know, ever since the AI news with Apple. And now they yeah. have, the, they have the, the Dell developer conference today. So the question is, will they sell that news because it's at a high? Because I always like to sell the news anytime there's a conference. Um, and I'm trying to get excited and it's like, you know, uh, it was exciting to be in silver and gold for the past six weeks, and now I'm just trying not to get, get rid of all my silver the way I did with gold last week, you know, and try not to trim and trail my way out of that. Did you guys play any silver and gold? It's been absolutely fantastic. Long term, just long. I've had it in since COVID, and it's just one of those core holdings. And I used to complain about it, 2,000, 1,800, 2,000, 1,800, two, you know, and then it finally broke out. And uh, silver, you know, just silver, it's been a laggard. That was a laggard trade. But, and it's just like, what are the, it just feels like with gold and silver, it's just like one day you're going to come in, gold's going to be down 150 bucks or you know, that's just the way it trades. You know, everyone gets in, you know, on one side of the market. But um, just I just want to talk. This before, I, I'm just listening in the background here. And I mean, just going through what Scott just said. I mean, Betty is kind of tired. AMD is kind of tired. Yeah, gold and silver rip and TLT is a disaster. I mean, you're adding up all this stuff and it doesn't paint the most rosy <laughs> picture in the stock market here, Scott. I'm like, it doesn't make me just want to go out and buy, buy, buy ahead of the CPI number tomorrow. I'm kind of a little bit nervous. Yeah, listen, I think rightly so. Even even last week, they kind of shook the tree a little bit. If you remember last Thursday, they had that, oh, yeah. uh, you know, that big outside day. And then, uh, you know, if you finally were a bear and you were like, you know, ready to fight. If you did that on Friday, you got your tushy kicked, you know, because they, they just rallied them back on Friday. And then yesterday, you have an inside day. So things are coiled for tomorrow. So I do think that, you know, you could probably, instead of guessing, you could do some kind of call spread and put spread uh, on the spiders and the cues just in case there's an outsized move besides things you're, you know, you're committed to. I know as an active trader, you know, back in the day, in my first five years of trading, I would never have any positions into a big binary event like a jobs report or this or that but at our age which we're getting old you can see by the far end the gray <laughs> i could massage you know six seven eight positions that i think you know i could you know handle with my tier system and then sell some premium with the spies as a hedge but you know i do think tomorrow is going to be interesting let me hear i guess go to my charts for a second like if you sure, look at that you know, look at the chart of the of the of the cues real quickly um are right, you I'll, I'll press present right that's sort of share screen share screen well, not the uh, uh, entire screen, you know, there you go, share. So <laughs> let's see. So you, you see here like this channel. So, you know, it's just a question is, um, is this just a normal consolidation after, you know, a huge move that we saw or is, or is it going to, you know, break to the downside? But at least it's tight, right? That's all you could ask for as a trader. You can say, hey, you could buy the 443 calls for Friday and sell the 449s and that's, you know, to be involved, that's your call spread, or you could buy the 439s and sell the 435s, or you could do like a lotto spread and say, hey, you know, I don't want to risk that much. I'll buy the 447s, you know, and then not even do a, you know, a spread just so right. you risk, you know, so you, or you could buy the 435s, the puts, you know, because that's how tight we are. Um, so for me, I'm going to revisit that probably a little later, you know, um, today to just see where we're at. You could, do, you know, then you look at the spies. That are very tight. Like look at that little doji, you know, that the tiny little doji yesterday, <laughs> right? 
So do you, uh, would you do that on a weekly or would you give yourself a little, you know, a little bit more room? Cause there's so would, much juice in the weeklies. I would do the weekly just because you're playing for a binary event. I'm not playing for a trend. Like you have sometimes like, Oh, is news coming? When's it going to trigger? Like you have the CPI Wednesday, you have the PPI later in the week. So it's either something's going to give or not. So when there's a binary event, I like to go shorter term. So I'm not paying for the time. And if there's a lot of juice there, you just make it into a spread. So you're covering yourself on the other side of the juice. You know, so if you buy a call, you could sell a call higher. They're giving the same juice. You, you know, you're limiting your upside, but at least, you know, you're in that game. But if you look here at that, this doesn't look like a whole lot. But then you're, you know, then you're like, oh, look, let me look at the weekly chart. And this is what's kind of scary because you're like, oh, ascending on a run that it's been in, you know, and it's sending channels are great until they break. And this has been riding and riding. And now, you know, it's still just, is this going to be a, cons a, you know, a channel now? Or, you know, or is it going to break here and see some downside? It's hard to tell. The rotation has been plentiful. You know, in the last six, seven weeks, you know, the equal eight S&P played catch up. It's not just about seven names. The energy went, banks went, you know, small caps been decent. Metals went. It's like a lot to like if you're not just looking for a correction like most people on TV do or most economists say. You know, I mean, that whole channel higher has been driven by the AI trade for basically three months, and then we've cooled off in the AI trade for the last month, and the indexes aren't going higher. So, I don't think it's coincidence that some P's you know up, you know, barely up since where we were a month ago because NVIDIA and the major companies have cooled off. So, I, I it, it's interesting setup this week. I mean, you know, the AI trades cooled off, trades have cooled off. You have a CPI number that is very much going to matter. So can you do the, Did you do the technicals on the TLT? I know you did that last time we were on. I just want to know, do we have some support coming here? Do you have a chart on? Oh, he does. He's got yeah, it up here. You know, there's, there's a, you know, it's it kind of broke below this 92-ish. Yeah, yeah. Then, that was a big level. But then hit a low of 91, and it's been a, a little bit oh, above wow. it. So it seems like the market cares more when there's like a new little threshold. So it looks like rates made a high probably on April 3rd. And since then, you know, hasn't gone above that or and this hasn't gone below that so it's you know it's trying to ignore it if the cpi comes in really hot tomorrow and the tlt breaks below 91 chances are market's going to be pressured you know if the cpi comes in line or a little light then hey then maybe this bounces back up and then it's it's not an obsession for for you know for a little bit until it is so um at this point i'm i'm kind of not that excited <laughs> <laughs> You know, sometimes you're like chopping at the bid. You're like, oh, I can't wait to have a call spread in the video, buy high, sell high, this. And now it's like, I actually have an open house this week, you know, with hundreds of people that are there that all want action. I'm like trying to figure out where am I, you know, where, where am I? It, it's action? a quiet yeah. week. I mean, we do have the CPI, but I mean, the earnings calendar is non-existent until Friday when we start getting the banks. And then it starts getting exciting the following week here. But this, we, these last couple of weeks is quiet from an earnings perspective here. So there isn't a lot of catalyst. I mean, that's why there's probably more pressure here for the CPI to not be hot because you don't have like an earnings, you know, report that's going to, you know, bail us out if the numbers, you know, is well, Friday, Friday. I mean, we have Delta tomorrow. The we got the banks on Friday and, uh, They've they they've had some nice. The runs. banks never seem to move the overall yeah. market anymore. They used to. Scott remembers the days where we really kicked Goldman Sachs earnings driving S and P's higher. It yeah, just yeah, seems true. like, and they always they sell J P Morgan on numbers, no matter what. Yeah, they do. No matter what. But you, you, you can have Morgan, that theory, and you uh, can still get run right over in it. It's always yeah. they always do that at J P Morgan. It's just the timing of it. But uh, you want to look at the uh, weekly yeah. chart of J P Morgan. Look at this monster move that it had. Wow, I haven't even, I don't, you know, I haven't been playing the banks. I played Goldman and Morgan a few weeks ago. It had a good move, but look at this move in, in JP Morgan. It's funny how he's always negative lately, too. Like the, the highs of rates back in October, he, that's when he said, oh, they can go to 8% when the 10 year was like a 5.2, and that was the high. And now he's still talking about deficit spending, this and that. And meanwhile, you know, JP Morgan needs a good economy and a good stock market. He talks out of both sides of his tush lately. Yeah, but, well, I, but he's always conservative. <laughs> I yeah. saw I saw Jamie Dimon speak here in Detroit about a year and a half ago, and I was actually pretty blown away. Like he, you know, seemed like a very smart, intelligent guy. Like enjoyed the his talk, but at the time, he basically said like, "Yeah, the market's gonna be, you know, go through a really tough time here, this and that." And then we just continue to make you know new all time highs. So he was wrong when I heard him speak a year and a half ago, and he's basically he, saying the same stuff now that he was saying a year and a half ago. So as long as if you AB, keep saying, he's always wrong with his market commentary. It's unbelievable that he runs the bank so well. He's lucky he's not a stock trader. 
Lucky yeah, Jamie yeah. Diamond is not a stock trader because Bitcoin is, you know, a bubble and it's going to burst and it's nothing. And, you know, the, the recession's coming. We got to be conservative here. Interest rates are going to go to 13% or whatever the hell he's talking about here. Yeah, that's well, lucky, Scott. But two he's days lucky, after that, trader. two days well, after that, their, their chief market strategist comes out and says, you got to buy this market. You got to absolutely buy everything in sight. So they, like, they hedge, you know, the, you know, the Chinese wall there, they always, uh, they always, you know, come out, you know, and Diamond says all these uh, negative things and then, you know, boom. Uh, Scott, I wanted to ask you real quickly, uh, you were talking about Apple last week and it did get a little, a little bit of a pop, but man, oh man, I mean, the way I look at technical analysis, the longer you hang out near a major support level, the better chances yeah. you're going through it. Uh, would any take on Apple? You know what? I haven't traded Apple in three weeks, and I used to be like the Apple okay. trader. You know, like years ago, I was the Apple trader. Then I was the Tesla trader. And the last six months, I've been the Nvidia trader. Now it's like, you know, it seems like when Apple's a laggard, the market doesn't care that much. But when it starts to break lower and go to new areas, the market cares and tech cares. So I do think this 168 area is pretty important for Apple. And then if then you have 165, if this doesn't hold and they want to sell the market, you know. Uh, here you go, 157.50 is next, and then 148. So at this point, this is a pretty pretty key spot for Apple. But if you were shorting, you know, the market because Apple was going lower, you lost. So the correlations that we've had all changed. Same way, like you said, you know, Jamie Dimon was all negative. Same time Mike Wilson was, you know, and and oh. it threw a lot of traders off because those guys are smart guys, and you're like. The, the market's going up, but you don't want to feel like a dumb trader using technicals because the smart guys that are billionaires are saying the market's going to come in. So it created the cognitive dissonance in your head. So we, we go with the symbols DTA. You know what that means? Don't trust anyone. You know, that might be stays off until nine o'clock because I'm looking at the charts. I'm looking at the news. I don't want to hear anyone else's opinion because, you know, uh, strong opinions is what puts traders out of business. Flexibility, multiple plans True. is what keeps you moving forward. Yeah. All right, guys, if you do want to join Scott all week in his virtual trading floor, April 8th through 12th, again, that QR code is there on the bottom of the screen. You can also hit the link in the description. Also share that in the chat to make it easy for you guys. Uh, so again, if you guys want to join Scott, get to, he's doing 40 charts a day, 40 charts in the morning. You got to go ahead uh, and get some of those, Scott. If you, oh, you know what? I'll say one thing that I think I have some conviction on. I really feel like, Google, like Bitcoin's been, hanging here for a while you know if you yeah. look at the chart of uh of bitcoin on the daily you know i've been i've been accumulating bito calls for this week through may thinking that at some point okay this bitcoin has to have one more massive move mm -hmm. okay it's hovering here i know it's had a big move already but it's like when you have like a, a, the leader of a massive sector that's kind of on a massive move it doesn't end on a, on a failure it usually has to have one real real more blow off move so I think, you know, 73.8 is uh, is the high there. You know, BITO, there's like 32 and a half, $33 calls into this weakness. I'm trying to buy the $33 calls for like the, the first week in May. So this way, my risk is premium paid. A lot of Bitcoin happens trading overnight. But I do think there's going to be one more move where, you know, it's kind of like placing a bet on the over, which, you know, the stock market is not a casino. But I do think that... Um, you know, you, you accumulate some of these. I've been accumulating them already. Some of the thirty-three dollar calls in BITO, um, which you can go here, and at some point it's going to take this out, and there's going to be one more move, whether it's before the halving or a week or two after. So, you know, uh, we'll talk about it right here, and in the next month, you could beat the hell out of me if it doesn't happen. If it one doesn't. way or another. Hey, Scott, before we let you go, first of all, congratulations. I saw on Twitter your your son hit that shot. Uh, in the basketball game, that must be a lot of fun. But uh, I asked you, I, are you an NFL fan at all? NFL? Yeah. 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 I um, mean, do you have a favorite team? Unfortunately, I live in New Jersey and I've been a Jet fan for a while. But um, thank goodness for fantasy football, I get to root for players. Do you, do you, do you, follow, <laughs> do you, follow, the, you follow the draft at all? Um, not as close as I probably could. Like my son follows it, you know, he could name every college player in basketball and football and this and that, you know, for okay. me, I can name yeah. every stock, every level, every this, but <laughs> you know, I'm not that involved with, uh, the college scene. But okay, I, I was going to ask you, uh, the draft is here in the motor city, right below the, uh, world headquarters, Bob Benzinga. 
And uh, we're going to be doing a live stream uh, for the first round of the draft. And we are inviting different people to be the general manager for the day. And come on, be on the clock while your team's on the clock. Come out with your prediction. So we're looking for people from our chat. We're looking for some financial people. Uh, Look at Scott's, boy. Scott's boy. Yeah, Scott's boy. Can, can I put my son on there? I'll put Chase yeah. Weber on there. Yeah, there okay. you go. Okay. We'll do it together. We'll do it together. We actually do a fantasy team together, and he's my he's my gen- I'm the general manager. I pay for it, and he coaches. It. <laughs> <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay. All right. All right. That sounds good. Uh, AB just dropped the link in there. Yeah. Meet people from all the different cities, man. It's gonna be it's gonna be a wild draft. It's gonna be hundreds of thousands of people in downtown Detroit, and uh, it's gonna be a blast. I'm looking forward to it. But right, uh, Red Dog, thanks for you know thanks for coming on today, giving us you know a a calm, cool, and collected perspective on the markets, and we'll see what the CPI has in, in store for us. Yeah, that's you know all we could do is uh, prepare for the conditions in front of us and react with the with the right decision at the right time, and we'll see what that is tomorrow. And if you want to try and cheat one way or another, I would really do it with options, so at least your risk is premium paid versus making a guess. And all of a sudden, April tenth being behind the eight ball, you know, monthly or quarterly for your paycheck as a trader, it's not worth it. Beautiful. All right. Well, Scott, again, you've got that link in the description. We'll drop that in the chat again. Scan the QR code. Scott, as always, thanks for hopping on with us. We'll uh, we'll catch up soon. Yeah. And send me that information. I'll definitely do it with my son. That sounds like a lot of fun. Great. All right. We'll do it. It is fun. Uh, all right, guys. We have about eight minutes left. Dennis, yep. Joel, what are the uh, what, what have we <sighs> missed today so far? We got a, a Wells Fargo downgrade. We haven't <laughs> talked about that yet. Uh, not a lot of major headlines this morning. No, we're in the lull. And again, I think, you know, even looking at the S&P range from yesterday, I actually chose probably a very good day to take off because you're quiet ahead of the CPI. I mean, we're probably going to be somewhat quiet here today. People hedging their bets ahead of tomorrow's 830 number because it matters. I mean, I'm not initiating new, like, you know, unless, and like Scott says, we all take chances, you know, and I'm going to have some positions on, but I'll make sure that I'm trying to hedge as best as I can going into that number because, we don't have, you know, we're, we're, we, we don't we don't know what the number is going to be. It will be major market moving, though, either direction, unless it's even, you know, and then it's like, oh, we'll try to figure it out. But I mean, if we get a hot number, the whole and again, the market is tired right now, like just to what Scott was saying, gold been ripping, silver been ripping, TLT, TLT been dipping. Yeah. I mean, and then Apple sitting here just hanging on support. looks like it's ready to fall off a cliff. Google's holding on. Amazon's holding on. They're always buying something. But NVIDIA, the AI trade stalled out here. It has. It is a lot of signs here that the market is tired. So it needs a catalyst. The catalyst would be if the inflation data comes in light, then there'd be green light go and start buying these stocks here again. I'm scared, though, that the bond traders are smarter than I am. I'm scared that they're sitting here thinking, no, I'm going out here and we can feel it, that the rates want to go higher here, at least the long-term rates, and that is not good for stock. So the TLT lie detector test, if you're just following that, and it has been the case, you are probably selling stocks ahead of this report. I'm nervous for stocks going in. Again, today, we're going to be quiet, but at 8.30 tomorrow, I'm going to be hedged. I'm not betting long. All gloves off. Yep, yep, yep. And the good thing I – or sorry, go ahead, Joel. No, I, I was just going to say, and you know, there's always the, the the reaction and then the reaction to that. So there's, but you know what? You got good levels. And I, I would just say so far, and Dennis, it's so funny that we, we, you know, when we spoke on uh, Thursday at the University of Windsor, you know, we had the big down day, the big volatility. You know, what we said was, is, you know what? Got to calm down a little bit. You know, it's usually if you get the bad day and then you get another bad day, which we just haven't had. I mean, what if we had like two huge red? Ca- I mean, look, like going back to the beginning of the year, kind of faked everybody out. I'm looking at DES here, but we've we've stabilized, and you got a great level on the downside. Last week's low. As long as we stay above that, I mean, that 5200 sticking out on the dailies like a like a sore thumb. And then the battle, you know, the all time closing high 530850. You have a really defined range here. And I'm not going to use the all-time high because I like the all-time closing high. The market's got to decide. We can't stay between 5,200 and 5,300 forever. You got you got your levels there. Bulls still firmly in control. 
I don't care about the TLT. I don't care that Apple's sitting at 168 and a half. As we speak right now, the bulls fought back on Thursday. So that's where we stand uh, in the market. We got an even a nice rally going in today. I'll just say we're opening up into yesterday's high. So if you think it's going to be a choppy, two, you know, kind of a two-way kind of day, look at your highs from yesterday. Uh, could be a good level for you. Friday's high just above that. I was going to say, the good thing about going into these reports like, with a somewhat more like conservative posi positioning is that say you do have names you like, Apple, Tesla, whatever, and then the number comes in hot, boom, now you have a lower price point to potentially get in after the fact. Although typically, you know, it's not just a quick, you know, you don't want to catch any falling knives because those typically uh, tend to fall lower. But again, I mean, it, it, it's better than like, if I'm fully leveraged buying all these stocks before the number comes in hot, then boom, you're screwed versus being able to sit back, wait for the dust to settle, see where the stocks that you like are at, and then if they do go higher and you missed out on it, well, then probably it means the market environment's a little bit better and you probably still have some ways to the upside to go. So I don't mind going into this report with a slightly more conservative uh, positioning. Yeah, I'm very conservative. And even in the long term account, I know I've got most of my majority of positions, but I've, you know, rang the register. You know, we talked about that. I told my SMCI a while ago, I did sell half my NVIDIA position and I did sell half my AMD position. And I do I plan to get those back while well, they came in. Yeah, I would buy those back. Uh, but, you know, it's just tired right now, you know, and it's been a good run. So it's not like, you know, these trades are over and dead and, you know, this is the end of the bull. It's just, you know, we've come a long way. So, you know, maybe we get a little hot number tomorrow. Maybe it cools off stocks a little bit. You know, and that's what TLT is thinking is going to happen. We don't know. They could be wrong. Maybe the number comes in light. We're going to have to chase to get all these positions back. But there's always another trade. So, I mean, that's the one thing you can be like, you know, you go, oh, I got to bet on this. You don't have to bet on everything. No. And I don't want to bet on the CPI number tomorrow, even ahead, because, you know, I kind of think it's going to be hot and I kind of think stocks are going to get All hit, indications but, are. Yeah. But, but yep. I don't, all indications, but maybe that's already, maybe that trades on, you know, maybe it's a slightly hot and then maybe they buy yeah, them Everyone's anyway. talking so, about it now. That's the only thing that scares me about, yeah. like, instead of like, crowded, could be crowded. Happens, everyone, everyone thinks it's going to be hot. No, I the bond ever... traders are telling you it's going to be hot. I mean, yeah. TLT, these are the smartest traders in the world. And if TLT is sitting down here, it's telling you it's going to be hot. So maybe some of it's priced in too. You just never know reaction. I mean, and again, it's fun to make market calls. It's fun to bet on the NCAA. It's fun to do all that stuff. But, you know, the bread and butter is still taking advantage of market inefficiency and reacting to new information. I make my money not by my market calls. So yeah, sure, I did great on the NVIDIA call and the NASA call. But overall, through my course, my 24 years, it wasn't because, you know, I was, you know, predicting in the predicting business. It was because I was in the reacting business that I made money, that I knew how to react to new market information. At 8.30 a.m. tomorrow, I will be, you know, I'll be on this show till 8.20. I'm going to get off at 8.30 because I'm going to be reacting to market information. I'll be gone for a, quite a few minutes probably if it's a big move. But yeah, we'll have um, blue that's now. what you got to do is react to new information. If you're sitting there long, you've got to start getting out of stocks if the number's hot. You know, you've, it's it's all about just reacting to new information. The TLT is telling us, you know, it's going to be hot. And the stock market is telling us that they don't care. That, the, uh, Pretty you much. Know, that's been pretty good story, summary. That's, that's been the story the past, you know, year is that the inflation's been, or the last like six months or so, inflation's appear to be creeping back up higher. But then the stocks, the equity prices are creeping back up higher too. So eventually you've got to hit a point where it's, you know, I think again, if the number comes in, it's, it's probably, there's probably a range, right? Where if it comes in slightly hot, okay, maybe stocks and bulls can shake that off. If it comes in too hot, then we could be in trouble. You want to do but you got to know, like, this is why I listen to the shows like this. You know, what are you thinking about? Looking, you've got a setup here. Have your sheet and your setup. If the number is hot, this is what I'm doing. If the number is not hot, this is what I'm doing. You know, which stocks are am I going after? I'm going after solar. Right away, I'm going after solar. I mean, my 830 trade is all going to be if solar it's stocks. If it's light. If it's light. Either it way. Is. Now, if it's even, then I might just sit back and say, I don't know. But if it comes <laughs> definitively hot, I'm short in solar stocks. If it comes definitively not, I'm buying solar stocks because those things are going to move the most. So, but you know, those trades go so fast and you say, oh, I can't beat the algos. The algos aren't as good as you think they are. I mean, they overreact, they go this way. They're just not that smart. The algos, and AI is not in these markets yet where it's become, you know, smarter than all the other traders out there. It, it, we're not there yet. So, you know, this talk about not being able to beat the algos for, for literally, 
the last 15 years I've heard this. It's still the same markets. We're still consistently profitable. Like, you know, at least I am, you know, like it, it's all about just understanding the market environment you're in and reacting to new market information. But, you know, if you're sitting there just looking at charts and saying, well, I don't care about CPI. It doesn't mean anything to me. I don't care about any of these relationships. I just look, you know, whether the stock's breaking out or breaking down. That's a tough gig. I mean, I've never been, I have never in my 24 years been able to make money just looking at a chart. Never, ever, ever. I've always been the combo approach. I know the 830 number is coming. Scott Redler, he's he's positioning himself ahead yeah, of the CPI. Yeah. If he was yep. just not looking at anything else, just charts, it's not as simple. But he's using he knows the new information's coming in. He's cautious into this number. So you've got to be aware of you know the economic numbers that are coming in, the earnings, you know, what are the catalyst drivers of the day, all that stuff. That's how you become a profitable trader. It's not the magic formula on just looking at a chart. Um, all right. Well, it is 9.01 a.m. Eastern. Uh, I think we, we there are not a lot of huge headlines this morning. Joel, you mentioned Tilray's earnings real quick. Yeah. Uh, I mean, th those were not uh, I mean, cannabis stocks have been rallying into this based on the, you know, Germany legalization and some yeah. other things up 50 percent. Tilray was in the past month. This earnings report underwhelmed investors stock trading down 15 percent this morning, bringing some other cannabis stocks down with it msos is trading oh, actually MOS is hanging in there down about a percent this morning uh other headlines i saw one that black blackberry i don't, I don't even know if the company's still around announced a deal with amd stock trading higher on that news uh what is that bby bb <laughs> that's best buy okay double b double b double b remember the old symbol Rim, you can go all the way back to research in motion, R I M M. Yeah, yeah. And then it was Blackberry, which was what, what, B B R Y? Yeah, it was B Bree. It was B Bree. It was like my name. Was like my initials. Yeah. Uh, and then, yeah, so again, not a lot of headlines this morning, but I think we got to, you know, most of the big ones. Tomorrow will be a lot more fireworks before the open. Again, CPI coming out at 8 30 a.m. Eastern. We'll have those numbers for you. We'll be talking to Blue Putnam during that uh, report. So again, if you're looking for fireworks, tomorrow's the show to come join us. And then, guys, again, I'll drop this uh, draft link in the in the chat one more time. Fill out that form if you want to join us. Be the GM of your team for a day. Make some draft calls. We'll be a fun time. Joel, uh, Joel, and I, Dennis, you got to hang out with us too. I don't, you know, I know you don't have a team up there in Canada, but we'll still be fun. Uh, other than that, guys, thanks for tuning in. Smash for all the Lions like. fans in Canada. Yes, sir. We've got uh, live trading starting up right after this. We'll